to the Building Bite Podcast, a construction podcast for contractors, insurance professionals, and construction owners, where you can hear from the experts about key topics to help you be successful. I am Peter Duggan, CEO and President of Proactive, and I'm here with my co-host, Mike Dierksen, Proactive's Senior Innovation and Content Solutions Consultant, and our expert guest, Jeff Delisio. Jeff is Senior Vice President at Berkshire Hathaway Specialty Insurance, where Jeff focuses on underwriting surety and subcontractor default insurance. How are you doing today, Jeff? I'm doing great, Peter. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Mike, how about you today? Doing awesome, Peter. Excited to get this going. I Thanks know. for coming on, lot. Jeff. We got a lot of good stuff. The topic that we're going to go through today is the art of underwriting. And Jeff, I know you've been around the block and you have done a, an extensive amount of underwriting and have some really good tips for the audience. Before we get into some of those tips and ideas and experiences, could you tell the audience a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are now? Sure, Peter. I had uh, graduated with a civil engineering degree from Ohio State. I got into the uh, the construction field for about 10 years, was doing geotechnical work, foundation design, some site civil, went back and got a master's degree in finance, and, and at that point transitioned into the insurance industry. I've been lucky enough to work for uh, you know two national slash global surety companies. In uh, June of 14, came over to BHSI, Berkshire Hathaway Specialty Insurance, to start the, uh, the surety team, which also came to include subcontractor default insurance. Interesting. And you, like me, have an engineering degree and a MBA. So I think that's an interesting combination. It gives us a little bit of perspective and sometimes helps in this industry, certainly. Oh, definitely, definitely. It's great to be able to look at a problem from both sides. And while no one would want me designing a bridge they're going to run over <laughs> anymore, it's good to understand a bit of the technical and then to understand the financial aspects of it as well. Totally agree. Jeff, when we spoke last, you said something that was really interesting and a term you used. You said underwriting is like creating snowflakes. Each deal is similar, but pretty unique. Can you give us a little more insight on what you mean by that? Sure, Peter. In the space that I've always been in, right, which is, uh, if it's done well, is a low frequency, but a high severity space, kind of going into those discussions with customers and, and trying to understand what are they looking to solve? What is the problem that is keeping them up at night for lack of a better word. And then from that, right, it's, it's figuring out where there's alignment. Also kind of figuring out, you want the deal to be agreeable to both parties, right? I mean, the carrier has to take an appropriate amount of risk and then has to work for the customer. You know, from the carrier perspective, the price for that risk has to be appropriate and there needs to be, and alignment of interests. And, you know, I mean, the deal fundamentally has to work for both parties. Totally get it. When you're trying to determine the problem to solve or the problem your client is looking to solve, what does that process look like? There's a lot, a lot of listening, a lot of questions. In the space that, that I work in, it tends not just to be, we need X. It's our strategic business plan calls for us to move in this direction with these priorities. And as either the risk manager or the CFO, I got to, there's a responsibility to make sure all of that works together. There's a lot of listening. I will say we always hope for a very collaborative process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think how we try to look at it is rather than price first, and then figure the deal out second, it's does the deal structure work? Is there alignment? Are both parties going to be independent of the price? Are both parties going to be happy with the outcome? And then you can then begin to think about price. 
as an example, there are some deal structures that independent of the price, in my opinion, don't seem to work out well in the, in the long run. I'll take an example, not necessarily from the insurance industry, but from finance, right? You know, so in the financial markets, whenever you separate origination from risk taking, the end result over some cycle tends to be negative, right? And, you know, you can think back to 2005 to 2008, you know, from a, uh, from a U.S. perspective, you know, where we had economic downturn brought on by housing. At that point, in certain deal structures, there's no amount of price. There's no dollar amount that makes that deal for the risk taker a better deal. So I think that is where we try to spend some time thinking, right? And if there's alignment, if both parties are going to be satisfied with the outcome, then let's begin to think about pricing. Interesting. Okay, so let's paint a picture for the audience. You're sitting in a meeting. It's maybe your third or fourth meeting with a client that you're working with, and you hear something, and it says, oh, that's a red flag. I've got to be, I've got to investigate that a little bit further. What might be one of those kinds of things that's a red flag for you? I think it's really around that alignment issue, right? Is, is if there is a customer who is, you know, at the end of the day, looking to transfer as much risk as they can for the lowest cost, that doesn't fit this model. I'm not saying that's a bad approach. There's, corporate directives that they have to work within. So I'm, I'm, I'm not you know, throwing a stone, so to speak, but that approach doesn't fit in necessarily with the way that, that we're thinking about business and, and the way we're thinking about business from a collaborative standpoint. It makes total sense. So if someone comes to you and says, I want a no deductible, no premium, high limit policy, that's probably like, uh, yeah, not going to work. <laughs> I'll give you names of three competitors, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you ferret that out in the first meeting instead of the third. How about on the flip side, Jeff? What about you hear something or you get a vibe in that first meeting or second meeting and say, yeah, this is a business I want to do business with? I think it it is companies that are truly introspective about themselves, their processes, their people, Right. Folks that want to learn, want to get better, and while they may be very comfortable with where their world is today, they're continually looking to get better. They want more information. They want different ways to maybe think about a subject. Those are great customers. Those are great, great customers. Yeah, and Jeff, speaking of of customers who are kind of looking at the world and how it's working, kind of evolving. Something we hear a lot about now is big data. That seems to be the, the number one topic. Everyone always likes to talk about that. And I know when we last spoke, you know, you had brought that up a little bit. Could you tell me a little bit more about that, right? You mentioned maybe the, there might be some issues with falling in love with big data when it comes from an underwriting perspective. That's a great question. You know, I, I, I think from our viewpoint, it's matching the product with the tool. There are certain products, just you know, take for example, private auto. Perfect, perfect place for big data, right? There's millions of data points. There is clarity around those data points. There's clarity around outcomes. They know exactly how much it costs to repair the fender. Perfect for big data to draw some really interesting conclusions. In the world I live in, and in the world you know, most of my peers live in at BHSI, we tend to be more in low frequency, high severity. There's not that much data, tends not to be that much data in that space to draw those same conclusions. And, and you know, kind of how I think about it is you know, when you reach out to grab a tool from your toolbox, you just need to make sure that you're grabbing the right tool for the right space that you're in. One example that I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with just because the surety space is really a kind of a poster child for this type of data, right? There tends not to be a lot of losses. 
So frequency tends to be low, but severity tends to be significant. And, you know, over my, my career, there, there's been several times that I've, you know, sat down with a group of actuaries and they were going to come up with the perfect model to model this business. And you get going and they're, yeah, you know, they, generally the conversation goes something like, yeah, you know, we've, we've seen your loss ratios for a month. Can you, or our, our loss results for, a, for the month, can you, you know, can you get me the, uh, the other 11? And generally from a surety perspective, you're like, no, nah, that's two years worth of losses, <laughs> not a month. And then they're like, well, we can't do anything with this. And I'm like, you're probably correct. There's not a lot to be done with that from a, you know, from a pure mathematical modeling standpoint. Right. That's interesting, Jeff. And I, I have a question about that building on the data piece. We talk to a lot of our clients about the risk of interpreting data when it, it's only the claim data, right, as opposed to the entire enrollment. And let me give you an example of that because I want to hear from you because given your expertise in this space. If a carrier looks at, for example, a healthcare and their losses in healthcare and finds that, oh my goodness, 20% of my loss is in healthcare, but the overall book is not considered, where you might find that, oh, well, healthcare accounts for 40% of our premium. So that lands up being an, a good risk. We find that there's a lot of reliance on the loss data and not as much reliance on the enrollment data. Do you see that as a trend in the industry? And is that maybe changing a little bit? What are you seeing there? Yeah, you know, I would agree with that. I also think there is the claims data is is solid, is tangible. And sometimes whether it be the underwriting data around what a portfolio looks like or even cause of loss, you could go down a pretty tremendous rabbit hole of of what exactly is cause of loss. And I think how we try to think about it, right? I I, you know, at times we have conversations with, you know, some of our less experienced underwriters, right? And we'll be looking at a ratio or we'll be looking at something and, you know, somebody will say, it's 32.75%. And I'm thinking, right, embedded in that number is five assumptions, right? And it's like, let's call it somewhere between 30 and 35% and let's call it a day. I think anytime people use data, there should be a healthy respect for it both in what it can produce, but what happens if it's maybe potentially not used in the wrong way, but used in a way that the parties don't fully understand some of the assumptions based in it. I love it. And I'm seeing, Jeff, that conflict in the engineer and the MBA, right? The engineer's like, I want 35.75. What are the remaining digits, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Just, like, just, yeah. <laughs> I love the I love the point about data, and one of the things we've learned about data is U.S. data might be different than international data, right? And and different countries do business differently. I know you have the experience in writing internationally. You have a team internationally. Can you tell us about your international team and and what complexities that brings to the underwriting decision? Sure, sure. We're lucky enough to, in, in addition to insurance teammates, you know, kind of all over the globe. We have two surety underwriters in Singapore and one in Sydney. And, you know, I, I, I think the key to me, and this is the same, we have one underwriter up in Toronto. And, and even though people at times forget there's a little line between the U.S. and Canada, it, there really is a line there, right? I think human nature, you want to take every experience and bring it back to what you see every day. And I think when you're managing people outside of your home territory, even to make it a, a broader topic, I always try to think about whatever the situation is. This is how it would look in my world, in the U.S. world. Take me through how it would look in Singapore or take me through how it looks in Australia. And I think the other part is asking, are you surprised with that result? Or is that a result in your market that is typical and expected? I think coming to that with a certain humbleness 
knowing that you understand at a high level the product or the situation you might be talking about, but its particular application in that country is, is you know, whether it be laws, whether it be business norms, there's thousands of nuances and asking those questions, I think, is, is key to getting to good decisions. One thing on that, I'll, uh, kind of a funny item, but we do a lot of scheduling, right? And in the UK, the dating nomenclature is, year, yeah, you know, year, month, yeah. day, right? So I'm looking at these schedules and I'm like, what is the 19th month? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't make any sense to me. So yes, and obviously it gets a lot more complicated from there, but I, I hear what you have to say on that one. Yeah, and so Jeff, thinking about that a little bit further, Berkshire Hathaway has a lot of different offerings when it comes to the construction space, whether it's builder's risk, contractor's professional. I think when we last spoke about it, you mentioned pretty much everything except workers comp, right, is, is available for Berkshire Hathaway. So correct, correct. could you walk us through that a little bit? I mean, you have such a wide offering. How do you personally manage those relationships? Because a lot of these, these coverages they do overlap in a sense, right? They kind of butt up against each other from a operational standpoint, from the usage standpoint. But then how do you do that? And then how does Berkshire, you know, kind of factoring that into their decision-making process? Yeah, sure, Michael. We chose very early on, you know, not to have, you know, the industry seems to call them verticals, right? Because, you know, so you can have a real estate vertical or a construction vertical or a high-tech vertical. And, you know, I, I think for us, what that though means is you then have a matrix organization, right? Because then an underwriter has, has somebody in that vertical that they may report to, and then also then has somebody either by geography or by product line. We're not big on complexity. Simple is, is uh, really good for us. So we started from that initial point of view is we wanted our organization in our underwriters, and, and then we hoped, right, people outside of the organization to have clarity on where they go. You know, to a certain extent, that transfers, I'll say, the responsibility from a customer picking the right person to talk to is, you know, myself and, and my peers, whether they be in, in the U.S. or North America, you know, including our, our, our team in Canada or, for that matter, worldwide. We need to be fluent in the customer base. We need to be fluent in the submissions. You know, I will tell you, I've been with BHSI now for, you know, seven years. I have learned more about insurance lines that I'm not responsible for. I've learned more in the last seven years than I did in the previous 20 years. And it is that, that approach of a very personal but professional responsibility to make sure that we are connecting the dots internally. And, you know, where we, where we aspire to get to, we're not there yet, but we think there is value, right, in being able to collect the data, right? So, you know, if there is a, a casualty submission, a CSIP submission on, on a specific project, and we have a builder's risk, and then we have a risk engineer that went out for builder's risk to do that site visit. And then from a surety perspective, we may get that project submitted, right? There is value for all of, all of those underwriters to understand that information, right? I think it helps. We'll make better decisions. I think we'll make quicker decisions. And I think, you know, we hope that kind of once we get our systems in a place, we'll end up asking the customer less repetitive questions, right? Because the builder's risk underwriter won't ask the same thing that the casualty and, and the surety. We're looking at developing a holistic view of that customer. Jeff, as we start to digest and absorb all of this information, we like to give our, our audience a couple of key takeaways and maybe even one action item. So not to put you on the spot here, <laughs> but can you think about maybe two or three takeaways and one action item that you might recommend? Sure. I think the first takeaway would be, you know, for the, 
you know, for the customers or the brokers, right? I think engage with your underwriters, right? I, I think that, uh, you know, having that discussion, having them understand what you're after, understanding the strategic initiatives of the overall organization that at the end of the day may not per se have anything to do with risk management, but impact how risk management is carried out, engage in that discussion. You know, now the opposite side of that coin is as an underwriter, we have a responsibility. If we take your time, no one has too much time these days, right? So, you know, if we take your time, we're going to give you back something other than just a canned answer that you could have gotten without that investment of time. So I, you know, I, I, I do think, you know, that is, that is one very important piece of the puzzle. I think the other one, you know, is around, you know, from a carrier perspective and, and, you know, something we think about quite a bit is making sure we don't fall into group think, right? I mean, every product, in every situation, right, whether it be geographic, whether it be driven legally, again, by product, there are nuances to all of those, right? And, you know, and sometimes in big global companies, things kind of, there's a bit of a flavor of the day or, or this is important to everyone. And, you know, while those things, uh, there is some value there, kind of stopping and thinking, you know, is this point appropriate for my product? Does this point help my customers? Does this point help us? You know, it, it's it's a you know, kind of taking a breath and thinking through it. Sometimes is definitely beneficial. And you know, I think, and I don't know if it's a call to action or a takeaway. I'll let you guys decide. But you know, the you know, within the organization, right? We we do try to be really humble, both with dealing with, with our fellow teammates or dealing with customers outside, right? And there's not a more inviting question than, I don't understand that. Help me understand that, right? Being, being open and being humble, that is such an inviting question. And it becomes a way to build really great relationships. And then also kind of further down the road, if you're wrong, which I, I seem to find myself there now and again, but uh, <laughs> if you're wrong, say you're wrong, apologize, whatever is appropriate for the situation and, you know, move on and, and fix it, right? I mean, if you think about opportunities to really deepen a relationship, again, either internal or external, that kind of situation, I get that it's a negative. No one enjoys being wrong. If you can kind of get your mind around that a different way, the opportunity to turn that into a very, very positive situation is just right around the corner. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, great. It's a great reminder to everyone just that, like we said in the beginning, you know, you're underwriting snowflakes. Every situation is different. While maybe from far away, it looks like everyone's the same or has the same interests case-by-case case basis, each relationship, each case is, is very different than the other one, although it may look similar at the service level. So, you know, kind of moving into the, the end here, we do have a couple speed round questions for you. First and foremost, what about your job right now? What makes you energized to go to work every day? I love being part of the construction process, right? And I mean, we, I mean, we just play a small role, but if you think about just, you know, you kind of divorce yourself from, from the daily grind, right? Contractors go out to a virgin piece of property. They have weather, they have permitting issues. They, I mean, the laundry list of things that they must overcome. And magically, 36 months later, there's an asset there. It is magic, so to speak, to see it occur, but it is just an incredible process to be part of. And it is, uh, you know, it, it is something that I've luckily been involved with my whole career. Jeff, I got another one for you. And you really come off, and I know you, to be a humble person who, as you've spoken many times, listens intently. So I'm sure throughout your career, you've grown substantially, but there's probably still 
a place or two that you are growing professionally? Where would you say that is? You know, Peter, I would tell you that, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 I doubt my journey has, you know, is too different than others, right? You know, you're younger, you get out of school, you think you have all the life's answers and everything's kind of tied up in a box and you put a bow on it. And I know exactly how the world works. And I will tell you, I think every year, the more I experience, the more I get to learn, you know, the more I, I come to the understanding that there's a lot more to learn, right? So, you know, rather than to a certain extent climbing the mountain, I think the mountain, at least in my mind, gets a little bigger every year. And, you know, especially around working with people, right? Whether they be teammates in, you know, internally or customers externally, the world today moves at such a pace that a top-down directive structure of management and interactions just doesn't work anymore, right? The time that occurs, you know, you need to have an answer back to a customer. That underwriter needs to understand what the parameters and, you know, how would Jeff think about this question or, right? It, it's, it's that speed. And that is, you know, I find that every day to be really challenging. And I find that, you know, every day to be learning more about that, right? I mean, it's very gratifying to be involved in that and to see people grow and, and, and to see people expand their careers. But that is uh, learning, learning about people every day. Excellent. One last one. Tell me one thing people who know you, like myself, might be surprised to learn about you. The surprise question. If one would listen to my children, they would say I'm pretty boring and I'm kind of an open book. <laughs> but I would tell you I love the ocean, right? I, uh, I grew up landlocked, so to speak, in Ohio and uh, actually got to the age of 20 before I saw an ocean. So, you know, we uh, wasn't a lot of traveling, wasn't a lot, you know, I saw Lake Erie quite a few times, but, <laughs> but not an ocean. So being kind of in and around the ocean provides a lot of joy. All right. I think that might set up our last question here, Jeff, because as you may know, the, the podcast is called The Building Bite. That's BIM Insurance Technology with the Experts. But we do like to ask our guests, you know, what are you taking a bite out of today? So maybe some seafood? Oh, definitely, definitely. There's not a lot of silver linings to COVID at all. We live north of Boston. You know, one of the only silver linings is, has been, you know, in, in some of the towns up here, fishermen still need to go out to the Atlantic to earn a living. They don't have the restaurants to buy the fish. So, you know, uh, several of them have gotten together in, in a entrepreneurial way and, and are, are now selling the fresh catch out of uh, food trucks. So, you know, at the end of the day, about, you know, three, four o'clock, you can go down to the docks and you can get, you know, whatever, whatever was caught that day, right? Whether it be halibut or, or some, you know, haddock or whatever they may be. So we've definitely been eating uh, from last March to this April been eating a lot of fish. That's beautiful. And it matches up with your ocean interest as well. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for chatting with us today. I think you, you gave us a lot to think about in respect to, with respect to humility and listening and continuous learning. I think those are tremendous lessons. If the listeners want to catch up with you, where do they find you? I'm on LinkedIn. And then I'm sure, you know, we can get an email address out or cell phone. You know, people are always surprised. You answered your phone. Well, <laughs> you called it. So that would <laughs> seem to be the appropriate thing to do on my end. <laughs> Fabulous. Excellent. I think that's a, uh, uh, that's been a great show. We really appreciate your time and we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to The Building Bite. This podcast has been brought to you by Proactive. Check us out on thebuildingbyte.com, where you can subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media for all future The Building Byte news and updates. You can also find us on your favorite apps, including Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Amazon. If you have ideas for episode topics that we should cover on the show, or you know somebody who would be a perfect guest, let us know at connect at thebuildingbyte.com.